Welcome to episode two of my Honda ST1100 engine rebuild. And in this episode, I'm starting to reassemble the bottom end of the engine and build the gearbox. With the engine upside down, I can check the big end play using a dial test indicator, just as a rough guide so I can see if one's worse than the rest. And sure enough, number one cylinder had 0.08 millimeter clearance, which is the upper end of the maximum wear limit for the engine. When the engine's manufactured at Honda, they measure the diameter of the crank pins and internal diameter of the connecting rods and assign them letters and numbers. So on the connecting rods, they have numbers assigned. In this case, it's two, and all four con rods were two, which determines a specific size. And the crankshaft is marked with letters and numbers to correspond with the big end diameters and the main bearing diameters. In this case, I've got A, 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 and B. So when I compare these markings to the chart, I get A and two, which should be a green shell, and then the B and two should be a brown shell. So I can check what colour I've got in the engine when I take it apart. So now I can remove the big end caps and lift out the crankshaft. I undo the big end cap nuts evenly, a bit at a time. Once loosened, the nuts spin off freely by hand. With all the big end cap nuts removed, I put them into a tin lid and spray them with some degreaser to give them a clean. I have a quick look at the nuts and they're in mint condition, really smooth and nice, with very fine thread and forged flanges. I pull off the first big end cap and have a quick look at the bearing surface. Initially it looks really nice and smooth, but then I notice a slight discoloration in the centre like it's worn. I pull off the second cap and that shows the same discoloration in the centre, but the cap itself is in immaculate condition. And here you can see the green marking on the side of the shell. With all the caps removed, I can finally lift the crankshaft out of the engine. It's quite heavy and has to be done very carefully so you can wiggle it out past the connecting rods. With the crankshaft removed, I can remove the connecting rod bearings. The crankshaft looks immaculate with no signs of wear, so I'll give it a quick wipe with some tissue and I'm going to measure these diameters and see if they correspond with the markings on the webs. So I set the micrometer to the correct size it should be, and it slides over just nice on the first one. Won't go over the second one. Won't go over the third one. Won't go over the fourth one. So I move it up half a thou, and now it slides perfectly over the number four, perfectly over number three, perfectly over number two, and number one is loose, and that's the one I could feel when it was in the engine. And here's a close-up of the big end journal, and as you can see, it's really smooth and shiny. Now, the strange thing I've got now is that all the shells are green, and yet the crankshaft has got one web that's a B and three webs that are an A, which specifies different sizes. And the one that's small corresponds with cylinder number one, and that has a green shell, 
Now, I think it needs a brown shell, so that's what I'm going to order. Hopefully, that'll resolve the issue. I also noticed that all the shells had the characteristic mark in the centre. I had a quick search on eBay, typed in Honda ST1100 shell bearings, and some came up in green. The guy had 11 for sale, so I was able to buy six, because that's all I need. But I really need two brown ones as well, and he had none for sale, and I couldn't find any anywhere. So I rang David Silver Spares, and they're on the case, and hopefully sending me some in the new year. With the big end bearings ordered, the next thing I do is check the main bearings, and they look absolutely perfect. I give them a wipe with a tissue, and they look brand new, so I'm quite happy to reuse those. Shell bearings for the SD1100 are becoming really hard to get. I guess it's because the engines are never really stripped down, mine being an exception, I think. I give the connection rods a little wiggle to see if there's any play in the little ends, and they're all really nice, nice and smooth. And the pistons look really shiny from up underneath, with no burning marks from oil or anything like that. So that's really good. I spin the starter idler gear, and that spins freely, which is really nice. So now I give a quick blow off with the airline, and it's all ready for assembly when the shells arrive. A couple of days later, the green shells are delivered, so now I've got enough to put three big ends back together, but the fourth one's brown, and I can't get those shells for two or three weeks, so I carry on anyway, because it's nice to keep busy. These bearings are probably over 30 years old, in their original packaging, and they're classed as NOS, New Old Stock Parts. I offer up a new bearing to the connecting rod, and the tang lines up just perfect, and it slides in with a nice push. They're sort of springy, so they push in nice and tight and hold in place once they're there. And the second one goes straight in as well. So that's really good. I'm really pleased with that. With the three new big end bearings in place, I apply some engine assembly oil. I also put some oil on the crankshaft as well, just to make sure. I then lower the crankshaft back into the engine, lining up the big end bearings as I go. The next thing to do is to fit the three green big end bearings into the caps. And they snap in exactly the same way as they did in the comrades. Just line up the tangs, push them down nicely and they snap into place. Well, that's the last green shell fitted, so now I can put some assembly oil on them and they're ready for fitting. The big end caps fit nicely over the studs, they're a good sliding tight fit, pressed down nicely onto the journal, and I apply some assembly oil to the thread and the surfaces so the nuts, when they're torqued up, they go to the correct torque. I spin the nuts down by finger, then use my T-spanner just to do them up loosely, and I'll be finishing off my torque wrench to set to the specified torque of 26 pounds foot. Well, that's the first one loosely fitted, so now I'll fit the other two. Using the same procedure as the first cap, I slide it down carefully onto the connecting rod and then, pour, and then apply a bit of engine assembly oil to the thread and the surface where the nut's going to arrive. Then I can replace the two nuts.
You can see here where I marked the big end cap to ensure it returns to its original connecting rod. With the three caps that have green shells fitted, the next thing I need to do is torque them down to, to the correct torque specified in the Honda manual. And in this case, it's 26 pounds foot for the big end cap nuts. This is the torque wrench I'm going to be using. It's one I borrowed from my friend Henry. I have got one, but it's a bit big and a bit old. And this one's brand new and never been used. And it's quite easy to use. You just wind the hat, the black part up until it lines up with the specified torque that you need. So to set up the torque wrench, you first rotate the black drum to line up with the 20 on the shiny part of the actual body, and then rotate the drum until the six lines up and that's 26 pounds foot torque. There we go, that's all set and ready for use. I'll just check it in the vise so you can hear the click. When you hear the click, that's 26 pounds foot torque and you stop pulling. So using the torque wrench, I gradually do the nuts up until I hear the click on both the nuts. Do this gradually, going from one side to the other side, bit a little bit at a time to make it even. There it is, that's that one done. And there it is, that's that one done. So now I repeat the process, talking down the other two big end caps. Well, I can't go any further on the engine assembly until I get the two brown shells. They're due in the new year. So for now, I'll cover up with a piece of cloth and I think I'll pop inside and see what Trace is up to. Well, that's really good. She's making a cup of tea. How does she know? She must be psychic, I think, because I've really planted a cup of tea. So in goes the water. That soon boils in no time at all. We've got a new kettle because the other one blew up and I couldn't mend it. And the hedgehogs and the flowers are looking nice on the windowsill. Well, they're not flowers, they're Christmas decorations. And in the tins, they're full of cake, but they're not cupcakes. They're leftover Stalin and Christmas biscuits and cake. And underneath is Christmas cake itself. So we're all caked out at the moment, so I didn't need to make any new cakes, not for a little while. These will take ages to eat. So now the kettle's ready to boil, pouring into the cup. I'm very fussy with my tea. I like it just perfect. And Tracy knows how to make it. So we put the tea bag in, give it a good squidge, add a bit of milk, and that's it. Perfect. So I take that tea back out into the garage to get on with the gearbox assembly while I'm waiting for the shells to come back for the engine. I'd bought another gearbox because I wasn't happy with the, with the one that came with the bike. It winds slightly in fourth, and even though it looked absolutely mint and I couldn't really tell us anywhere, I wasn't happy with the wine. So I took a chance and bought a second hand gearbox from a low mileage 2001 bike. I stripped the new gearbox down and inspected all the parts and cleaned everything thoroughly. I couldn't detect anywhere at all. So now I'm starting to rebuild it into my original outer casing from my bike. The selectors themselves are marked front, center and rear. So you line them up to put the rear one in first, obviously, then the center one, then the front one. But you have to engage them with the cogs and the gears as you put them in to make it all slide in. It's quite a fiddly job, but you have to sort of persevere and maybe try it once or twice, but you get there in the end. And then the shafts lower down through the bearings. And then the selectors themselves engage with the selector drum with a snap. And then when that's all snapped in place, you put the actual shaft in to hold it all in place. With the output shaft fitted, I can now fit the lay shaft. And this has to be done in two stages. You have to put the spacers, the big gear, and the bearing in first into the actual gearbox casing. Then lower the shaft down through them and into the bearing at the back. To make things a bit easier and to hold things in place, I smear a bit of grease on the shaft to hold the bearing and the little spacer shim in place on the actual shaft. So as I'm lowering it down, it doesn't keep falling off. I also use a bit of grease to hold the bearing shim in place in the gearbox casing to stop it from moving around. Well, that dropped in just perfect. It's always nice to hear the big click as it hits the bottom and it rotates nicely. I continue assembling further gears and selectors until the whole gearbox is back together. 
And here's the outer selector snapping into the selector drum just nicely. I'm now ready to push in the selector pivot shaft. This goes down through the three selectors and into the gearbox casing at the back. With it in place, I just check the gears rotate and they rotate lovely. So now I can put in the last gear and its bearings and shims. I just check it all rotates freely and it does. So when the outer casing's on, the first thing I'll do is check all the gears work. So the outer casing just slides straight on. No gasket or gasket sealer because it's an internal joint. I then replace the securing bolts. I slide the gear linkage onto the selector shaft and grip it with some oil grip so I can see if the gears work. So I lift it up and it clicks up, up five times and back down through the gears, eventually finding neutral and it feels really smooth and free. So I'm really pleased with that. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And hopefully in the next week or so, the two shell bearings will arrive and I can get on with the engine assembly. The hedgehogs are still coming to the garden to feed every night. They'd normally be hibernating by now, but I guess the weather's been so mild for this time of the year.